Oh listen to the sounding sea that beats on the remorseless shore. Oh listen, that sound will be when our wild hearts shall beat no more. Oh listen well and listen long, for sitting folded close to me, you could not hear a sweeter song than that hoarse murmur of the sea. Brian Toss once said that there are only three types of seafaring sailors. Dead, retired, novices, and pessimists. Sometimes I wonder, which are we? But first I should explain how we even got here, what we're even doing in this mess. Our particular story starts long before this moment, before we started sailing, and really before we were even born. You could say that my sailing life started in the late 1950s. In many ways, you could say that it all comes back to this guy, Everett Pearson. You see, before Everett Pearson, the realm of independent sailing belonged to the yachtsmen. These were the days when club ensigns ruled supreme, and wealthy men who, treading on deck with gleaming white dockers and matching shorts of an equally white gleam, sailed their beautiful wooden sloops from one yacht club to another. This, for them, was a sport. Much like tennis, only slightly more exhilarating and more conducive to the drinking of martinis. It was Everett Pearson who changed all this. The 1950s was the era of the suburbs, a rising middle class, DDT, and the post-war boom. Everett Pearson brought all of this to sailing, and he did it with plastic. He pioneered the fiberglass boat, the Pearson boatyard did not have the incredibly skilled craftsmen that you would find in other boatyards. All it took was a fiberglass mold, some rolls of fiberglass, and a few people to paint on epoxy. Once the mold was made, they could turn out one entire sailboat a day. Pearson thought he could make money not by marketing to these people, but, for the first time, selling boats to these people. While Pearson and his company did eventually go bankrupt, their vision was a success. Boats were produced in record numbers, and the aristocratic guild of yachtsmen was quickly contaminated by middle-class families. Yachts themselves were transformed from stunningly beautiful works of art to cheap production boats for weekend getaways. Don't get me wrong, the yachtsmen can still be found barricaded within the exclusive walls of various yacht clubs worldwide, but they're outnumbered. The important part however, is that there was a side effect to all of this. Us. When fiberglass boats first went into production, the naysayers went into hysterics. Traditionalists pontificated on the value of wooden construction and warned that these so-called boats made of plastic were bound to wear out and disintegrate within five years. But this was before anyone understood just how permanent plastic is. As it turned out, the curse of fiberglass boats was not their short lifespan, but their longevity. Wood rots, but just as plastic bottles now pervade landscapes with the patience of eternity, fiberglass boats litter the ocean. They are everywhere, and they are here to stay. Once a fiberglass boat is built, chances are that it will be here a century later. And at this point, they have been in continual production for 50 years. The problem is immense. Harbors are full of derelict boats swinging around on anchor lines long since covered with barnacles. Marinas keep expanding, but don't have room for them all. Slip fees go up, people stop paying, and their boats are foreclosed on. Nearly every single marina in the United States has a lean sail dock, where abandoned boats are auctioned off every few months. Most of them go for the entry-level bid. These boats, which were once a part of the dream for a new America, are now looked upon as trash. They're the lingering reminders of a mistake that just won't go away. This is to say that there are many boats just waiting for a second chance. 
Nobody at a marina is going to think twice about a boat which mysteriously sets sail off the lean sail dock late some dark night. The derelict boats growing barnacles at the harbor entrance are abandoned, and even the ones for sale are cheap. The Anarchist Yacht Club is the club for everyone who dreams about getting one of these, fixing it up, and sailing off into the salt seas. <laughs> Like anything, the secret is to begin. My first trip was on a 27-foot Catalina, which I sailed from San Francisco to Mexico and back, by myself. I knew enough to make it out of the harbor without hitting anything, and I learned how to sail along the way. The outboard engine I had broke on the first day, and it was the best thing that could have happened. I learned the most while sailing through breakwaters, into tight spaces, and off of anchor lines that I might have been tempted to use the engine for. On that trip, I read a lot about other solo sailors, real madmen who had set out to sea on long voyages alone and unassisted. Right away, even then, I knew that Brian Toss was wrong. There was a fifth type of sailor, maniacs. These are the people like Alfred Johnson, a Gloucester fisherman who'd run away from home as a teenager to become a sailor. During a card game in 1876, some friends dared him to sail across the Atlantic alone. He didn't see any reason why it couldn't be done, so he built a 16-foot open cockpit dory, got in, and sailed east. He was spotted by passing freighters a number of times, who were always astonished when he refused their rescue attempts. Eventually, he sailed into Liverpool, England, and became the first recorded person to sail across the Atlantic alone. Much later in life, when he was asked why he made the trip, he responded, I made that trip because I was a damn fool, just as they said I was. Or Elaine Bombard, who sailed an inflatable Zodiac dinghy across the Atlantic in 1952 without any fresh water, food, or stores of any kind in an attempt to test his theory that humans could survive by drinking small quantities of seawater. Despite having his raft speared and deflated by swordfish on several occasions, he limped into Barbados four months later, having survived only on seawater, fish, and plankton. And then there's the 1968 Golden Globe race, the first non-stop solo circumnavigation race, and probably the craziest sailing race of all time. This was a race designed for maniacs, and it brought them out of the woodwork. Nobody had yet sailed around the world non-stop, alone, and unassisted. The winner of this race would be the first to do so. And this was 1968. There was no GPS, no satellite communication, and no electronic navigational equipment at all. These people were setting off alone in small boats with nothing but provisions and a sextant. Jay Blythe was attracted to the idea of being the first to make it around the world nonstop, so he entered, having never sailed a boat before a day in his life. He had some friends sail out of the harbor ahead of him, so he could copy their maneuvers. When he hit the English Channel, he discovered that he didn't know where he was, so he turned right, hoping that he'd hit the ocean eventually. In the middle of the Atlantic, when he hit rough weather, he'd go down below to read his books about sailing in those conditions. He said it was like being in hell with an instruction manual. He made it all the way from England to South Africa before giving up, which is quite a ways and quite a rough sail. Bernard Motussier, a French sailing mystic, also entered the 1968 Golden Globe race. After seven months at sea, he was the front runner and expected to win. France was ready to receive a national hero. A fleet of French yachts was marshalling to escort him back across the English Channel from the finish line, where he would be awarded the Legion of Honor. Matissier was not happy with the prospect, though. He wrote in his logbook, Leaving from Plymouth to return to Plymouth feels like leaving from nowhere to return to nowhere. He didn't have a radio, but he'd report his position by slingshotting film canisters with notes on them to passing ships, who would then radio in his messages. After crossing under Cape Horn, Matissier hurled a note onto a passing ship which read, My intention is to continue the voyage, still nonstop, toward the Pacific Islands where there is plenty of sun and more peace than in Europe. Please do not think that I am trying to break a record. Record is a very stupid word at sea. I am continuing nonstop because I am happy at sea, and perhaps because I want to save my soul. He was essentially saying, fuck you people. Fuck your newspapers, your races, and your prizes. And so he just kept sailing around the world. He later wrote, I am a citizen of the most beautiful nation on earth. A nation whose laws are harsh yet simple. A nation that never cheats, which is immense and without borders, where life is lived in the present. 
In this limitless nation, this nation of wind, light, and peace, there was no other ruler besides the sea. He lived out the rest of his life as a citizen of the sea. Ernest Shackleton, Frank Worsley, Thor Heyderall, there are countless others. I thought about these sailing maniacs a lot. The more I read about them, the more I found inspiration through their stories. And the more I sailed, the more I understood about their conviction, the relationship they developed with the ocean, and the things that they discovered in themselves. The maniacs are the ones who have accepted their insignificance to the vast expanses of unrelenting ocean, and yet still sail on quixotically because they are in love with the direct, unmediated experience that they find out there, whether it's pleasant or harsh. By the time I sailed back into San Francisco, I knew a taste of this. I started to think about sailing farther off over the horizon, made plans with friends who had similar ambitions, and thought excitedly about things to come. One cold November, I set off determined to leave the icy rain behind for the welcoming waters of the Caribbean. The idea was that after converging with Ali, Lisa, and Kirsten in South Florida, we'd all find some kind of derelict sailboat, fix it up, and let the winds take us away. It was a long trip there, but I started smiling in the final stretch as the air got warmer. I arrived in Florida before anyone else and walked out to South Beach on my first night in Miami, thinking I'd like to sleep in the sand. Instead of a quiet, moonlit spot on the water's edge, I found a beach covered with bars, hotels, drunken frat boys stumbling away from happy hour, and waiters with lightning hands that made table diving impossible. No, I don't sell drugs. No, I don't have any trees, nuggets, or nugs. I ended up having to sleep on a nearby rooftop, but I did at least manage to find an empty swing set out by the water before turning in. I felt lonely being the first to arrive, faced with the isolation and overwhelming reality of nightlife. All I could do was close my eyes, swing on that swing set alone in the night, and feel the warm air against my skin. The next day I opened my eyes and watched the sunrise over the ocean from the east coast of Florida. I spent the rest of the day hitchhiking all over the place to look for boats and made it all the way to the west coast of Florida before seeing the sun set into the ocean again. I didn't find any promising sailboats that day, but accidentally discovered that since the coasts are so close together, the interesting thing about Florida is the possibility of seeing both a sunrise and sunset over the ocean in the same day. Eventually I contacted a guy named John who'd posted an ad for a $1,000 boat. He picked me up at the Fort Lauderdale Tri-Rail Station and drove me over to his house. The boat, a Pearson 30, was tied up in a canal that runs through his backyard, and it was a sore sight. This is a picture of the Pearson 30 from the original marketing material. This is the boat as I found it. There was no mast, no fittings, no engine, no bulkheads, no hatch cover, and no hardware of any kind, just the fiberglass molded hull. It appeared to wallow sadly there in the canal, beaten and alone loosely tied up to a dock that had partially collapsed into the water during the hurricane. I poked around at what little was there, and we sat on the water edge while he told me the history of the boat. It needed a lot of work, but the upside was that we could keep it in his backyard for a while, and he'd even let us work on it there. I decided it was probably our best bet, and sent pictures to Kirsten, Ali, and Lisa. They told me to go ahead and get it, and so the boat was ours. This was the beginning of a very long, very absurd scene where we lived like vagabonds in the backyard of a multi-million dollar Fort Lauderdale home, cut off from the world we're used to by luxury yachts and mansions. I worked on the boat alone for three days, singing to myself, eating pickles alone for lunch, and feeling the immense task of what needed to be done with borrowed tools and stolen lumber. Finally, one night I traveled back to the house where I was staying to find Kirsten and Allie waiting for me. Boy, am I glad to see you guys, I said while smiling ear to ear with sawdust in my hair. We all caught up on what had transpired during our travels there, talked excitedly about our plans into the night, and nodded with optimism at the work ahead. So this is the cast. Sometimes it seems a shame that Lisa grew up under the influence of punk rock, rather than some Victorian era of aristocracy, because she would, in many ways, make an excellent princess. Not the kind of princess that compels you to strangle her through her debutante demeanor, but the kind that charms you into doing what she wants, even as you know that you're being charmed into it. She is also the lead perfectionist of our crew. In the past, she has been known to section her backpack off into various compartments when hopping freight trains. In the context of sailing, any smoothing of caulk, bedding of hardware, or painting of fixtures are best left to her, because her standards are unmatched and best not attempted. 
She is also strangely obsessed with the word snacks. There are no meals, only snacks. You can spend an hour cooking quinoa and stir-fried vegetables over a weak single-burner alcohol stove cut out of an aluminum can, but make no mistake about it, this is a snack. Lisa's single greatest fear is collision at sea. Ali has a self-directed determination that reminds you of a high school dropout looking for all the answers in the world, but with the particularness of someone who's been looking long enough to know what they don't want. In her desire to be prepared, she'll have read every pilot chart and harbor description available for some place you're sailing to before you're even 100 miles away. If Lisa's single greatest fear is collision at sea, Ali's is running aground. Kirsten has a world-weary smile and a cadence that exudes patience. She's tough, can lift more than any of us, and once outran a bohemian sprinter in an impromptu 100-yard dash. She wears boots at all times, even in the tropics, because without them she feels unprepared. She completes the dialectic to Lisa's perfectionism by living in such a haphazard way that it's all Lisa can do to prevent herself from organizing Kirsten's bag for her. You can also count on Kirsten to accidentally drop things in the water, but always in an endearing way, and to my knowledge, she has given the ocean three shackles as well as our entire depth sounder, and I'm sure that the ocean has received much more on Kirsten's behalf that I am not privy to. And then, of course, there's me. My greatest fear is routine. For a month, we worked every hour of every day, waking up just before the sunrise and stopping when it was too dark to see what we were doing any longer. Rather than trying to nestle in with the wood shavings, fiberglass shards, and tools covering the inside of our boat, we'd just unroll our sleeping bags in John's backyard. So every night, I'd close my eyes under the wary gaze of the mansions and 120-foot motor yachts ominously stationed around us, wondering how long such an absurd scene could be allowed to continue. We were also faced with a terrible choice, swelter horribly in a too warm sleeping bag, or expose our skin to the merciless wrath of the night-hunting mosquitoes. There is no video, and only a few pictures from this time, but I will mention one particular incident, which is probably representative of our entire endeavor. During the construction, it was eventually time to put the mast on. The process is called stepping a mast, since it rests on a block called a mast step. The normal procedure is to find a boatyard with a crane, attach a line from the crane to the top of the mast, have it lifted to the right height, and then secure it in place. We called around, but no boatyard would let us use their crane unless we had insurance. We didn't have a title, registration, or even a hull ID number, much less insurance. So we mentioned our dilemma to John. So, one day, I hear John talking on his cell phone to some clients of his, whose boat he is going to sell for them because he's a boat broker. And he was asking them about different aspects of their boat, and then he was like, Hey, so, you know that David crane on the bridge of your fancy motor yet? Does that work? And they said, yeah, he's like, okay, just checking. Later that day, John told us that he knew where we could use a crane. So we carried the mast down to our boat, hauled it on board, and John towed us down the Fort Lauderdale Canal for close to an hour. Eventually, we arrived at a boatyard, where he maneuvered us over to a large power yacht, and we tied up to the side of it. I looked up at the second story of the power yacht and saw a small crane mounted to the deck for use as a dinghy davit. Essentially, they use it to raise and lower their inflatable dinghy into the water. Oh no, I thought. Lisa looked at me with amazement. That's the crane? Kirsten only smiled her big smile, pushed her glasses up her nose, and shook her head in disbelief. This is crazy. Sure enough, John explained that he knew the owners of the boat were out of town, and that if we were quick, we could probably get away with using their dinghy davit to step our mast. And I instantly was, was skeptical of the whole thing. It was, it's just not, it wasn't very tall, it didn't look very strong, it was definitely not meant to lift something as heavy as our mast is, so. My immediate perception was that this would be dramatically unsafe, and that it probably wouldn't work even if nobody was killed. But it was one of those situations where a legitimate businessman suggesting something so obviously sketchy makes you suspend disbelief. I mean, this plan was way over the line, but it just felt impossible that, with a lifetime of harebrained schemes behind us, we could cast any doubt on the feasibility of something suggested with a straight face by someone who had spent their whole life doing things by the book. 
Were we, a group of vagabonds, going to tell the rich sales broker that he was being irresponsible by suggesting that we sneak onto an unwatched yacht and use their dinghy davit to raise a 400-pound aluminum mast in a move that would almost certainly destroy their davit and, more likely than not, result in an aluminum mast crashing through their fly deck? Certainly not. So, without even a word or a trace of hesitation, we hooked the crane up to the top of the mast. John stood at the top with the crane and slowly started raising the mast up. The crane groaned and started to bend under the weight of the mast, but John kept raising it up. Pretty quickly, we were faced with the reality of just how unsafe this was. The crane was not nearly high enough, such that when it was all the way up, the mast was barely off the deck of the boat. We lowered it back down and reattached the cable to the center of the mast. This time, raising it up, we had to hold the bottom of the mast against the boat while the top wobbled back and forth uncontrollably. The worst moment was when, still not as high as it needed to be, we all grabbed onto the cables running from the top of the mast and tried to pull it the rest of the way into position. Just as we grabbed the mast cables, we heard the light click of the crane cable coming unfastened and swinging freely. Simultaneously, we felt the entire weight of the mast suddenly straining the cables in our hands. I looked up at John to see surprise in his eyes as he mumbled, uh-oh, with a cigarette resting on his lower lip. And I look up at the cable that is running Bump through the like a metal guide on the davit has completely fallen over one side. And John's just standing up there going, oh shit, with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And I instantly am like, I'm diving off that way. That's that's the back, that's where I'm going. When this whole thing comes crashing down and we're all gonna die, like, what? I'm diving out. I'm not sure how it happened, but somehow we all managed to pull the mast into the correct position and get our cable secured so that it didn't continue tumbling over in the direction we'd pulled it. Consulting with each other later, we all independently confessed that, at heart, we had each thought the situation was lost, and had all mentally prepared an escape route of exactly where we would jump into the water as the hundreds of pounds of aluminum mast came crashing down on us. For almost an hour afterwards, we sat in the cockpit of our boat in shocked silence, every now and then looking up at our standing mast in disbelief. Can you believe someone would start, while everyone else shook their heads and laughed? Did you see the look on John's face, someone would say, with the cigarette still in his mouth and everything? This was also the beginning of our luxury yacht squatting career. We stayed rafted up to this power yacht for another few weeks, and in our comings and goings eventually discovered that it was unlocked. The whole thing was just too inviting compared to the work zone of our cramped sailboat. There was a real stove, couches, and a bathroom with a shower. We were able to cook full meals for the first time in almost a month. After a while of this, someone who was hired as a caretaker for the motor yacht showed up during breakfast. We explained that, you know, we were only rafted up next to him for a while longer, and that the whole thing had, you know, just been so inviting. Despite the fact that he had been hired almost explicitly to prevent people like us from doing exactly what we were doing, if anything, he seemed happy to have the company. His name was Charles, and we all shared our mutual isolation in the New River Boat Works together. The story of our time in Fort Lauderdale goes on and on. It includes a lot of work and late night stealth scavenging missions, as well as such subtleties as sinking our dinghy and a New Year's Eve trip to the emergency room. They say, though, that ships are safe at harbor, but are built for the sea. While that's only marginally true in our case, we did eventually merge into the Atlantic. The rest of the season was spent sailing through the Florida Keys, gaping at manatees, having diving contests off the side of our boat, sailing along with dolphins, and visiting remote shores. We even organized a punk yacht race at one point. At the end of the season, the pestilence came to rest on Grand Bahama. A year passed and the pestilence weathered the summer rains alone. This winter, we returned. Okay, <laughs> do you want to pump our bilge? We've discovered that much of sailing is actually just working on your boat, because there's always work to do. The ocean is an incredibly inhospitable environment for metal and wood, so things are always breaking. 
Even just sitting quietly ashore, the pestilence was worse for wear. There was mold everywhere, the cabin had flooded with rainwater, and even our electrical wiring had disintegrated. When he was hired by these people to save this dolphin that had been choking on this piece of plastic or something in its stomach. Oh. Oh, <laughs> that's disgusting. This is disgusting. And it couldn't, he couldn't. <laughs> We'd entertain ourselves by writing haiku about our plight. <sighs> Mold is not my friend. I scrub it away because pestilence I love. <laughs> Clorox burns my eyes, but mold burns my soul. Yes, die, motherfucker, die. <laughs> And so, almost as a reflection of the year before, we started working again. side of this fence here there's this like weird uh, like resort that's just empty it's been empty for five years or something but uh, there's these security guards and these guys who work here during the day so during the day the guy's name is Errol and he comes over and hangs out with us and he, you know the other day he came over and he says uh, hey Moxie you know you good with the spear man and so he says, all right, yeah, 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 you know, there's some lobsters down there, man, you know. Tomorrow I'll bring the spear and you, you know, I'll bait him out, I'll bait him out, man. You, you know, you go down and get him. Yeah, so we spent all day, like, diving down and eventually we caught a lobster. I speared it with a spear gun. And uh, he's got this way of smiling whenever he really likes things. And he'll talk about something like a beer or a lobster, man. And he'll just, he smiles the smile like it's the best thing in the world. And yeah, I came up with that lobster. And he smiles the smile. He says, he says, uh... I told you, man, you can't go hungry in the Bahamas, man. You can't go hungry in the Bahamas. And uh, he's right, you know, he's the food's out there. And it was pretty fun, you know. And, you know, Kirsten and I were walking back from over there, and we were talking, man, if, you know, Fort Lauderdale were like this, man, it would have been fine, you know. It wouldn't have been hard work at all. So, anyway, I like it. I like the Bahamas. Eventually, the time we had in our Bahamian boatyard expired and the pestilence was destined for the water once more. People used to use a long series of logs for moving boats. Now they use giant boat-moving machines. Shelton Knowles, the man in charge, maneuvered over, picked up the pestilence, carried it over to the water, and lowered it in. But there was one last remaining task before our departure. At some point the year prior, John had convinced us that we should buy a Yanmar diesel engine from him on the cheap. I am opposed to the entire idea of having one of these mechanical monsters in a sailboat, but I was overruled. I maintain that they always break, never work when you need them, smell bad, pollute the ocean, are expensive to run or maintain, and make you a less competent sailor. We put one in, anyways, supposedly for safety's sake, but never really used it. And the agreement was that I wouldn't have to spend any time working on it, or have anything to do with it, at all. Once the boat was back in the water, all that remained was dewinterizing the engine before departure. Basically, just running the engine for a while and catching all the nasty exhaust that will come out in the first 20 seconds. Predictably, it wasn't that simple. I'm gonna tell you when to let go. And I'm gonna, and you're gonna watch until it's not funky anymore. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yes, and hold it until I say look up. Okay? Ready? Pearson? Yeah. You ready? One, two, three. Okay, um, try something else. Ready? 
Are you in? Push in? Okay, ready everyone? Yeah. This is so scary. Nothing. I'm gonna do it again. Ready? <laughs> this probably isn't the right yeah, key. What's key. that key for? It says Perco. That one says Yanmar. Dude, that is totally the key. <laughs> I can't believe you guys are using oh the wrong Oh my key. god! You guys are using the wrong fucking key this whole time. What the uh, fuck is that key uh, for? Uh, <laughs> what is that key for? Is it for the lock? <laughs> Still no. I think that's a good idea. Okay, are you in? Ready. When I say go, you undo. Okay. Like, let it out. Okay, ready? This was given to the boatyard, where I'm sure it was handled very responsibly, as if such a thing were possible. Once the engine had been coaxed along, we turned it off and sailed out of the harbor. The winds were a little stiff, and the seas were a little rough, especially for our first day out. We only made it two miles up the coast of Grand Bahama before our force day broke with a deep, reverberating boom that knocked us all to alertness. The force day is one of the cables that holds the mast upright, and without it, we were in a situation where the mast could very possibly have fallen. My heart skipped a beat with each large wave that swayed it further and further from side to side. I happened to be at the tiller when it happened, so Kirsten and Lisa dove for the bow of the boat. Waves swept over the bow, completely soaking Lisa and Kirsten through. Hair dripping and glasses covered with seawater, Kirsten hung over the bow to try and rig a temporary stay as Lisa held her feet. Occasionally, Lisa would look back at me like, can you believe this shit? And I'd smile as if to say, no, I can't believe this shit. This is the cabin after we almost died. <laughs> Don't show my panties. Well, at first, unfortunately you weren't with us when we were sailing. We had some pretty big seas, our first sail out um, this time. Um, so here, let's just uh, show you this. This right here is called our force day. That piece right there, um, ideally, is permanently, more or less, attached right here, where you can see it's been ripped out. What is the force day doing? <laughs> so the force day, Allie, <laughs> holds the mast up along with the back stay and the six shrouds that we have. When we lost the force day, you can look up here to the top of the mast. Imagine watching that mast swing about six, eight, ten inches back and forth all around. While three of us are scrambling on deck, two of us are not clipped in, waves are coming over our heads, I'm trying to attach this, which is a halyard that holds up the jib, the jib. Um, our force. We'd anchored in a strange waterway near the town of Port Lucaya, which was quite a ways away from the populated areas of the island. It was a long hitchhike into town, but at night, the stars shone brightly. We had to stay there until we found a machine shop, which would make us a new chain plate for our force day, but we did our best to amuse ourselves while we were there. This <laughs> <laughs> is gonna be fast. Dude, this thing is low drag. <laughs> Looking good. Will you turn around for us when you put that on? Boobs in the front. Can you turn around a little? <laughs> so I lost my swimsuit. It's in the water. So I have to wear Kirsten's while I dive for it.
You want to get my towel while you're at it? <laughs> Where is that? I don't know. Okay. You just gonna... <laughs> 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 Are you gonna... Every once in a while, someone would have to make a water run. You're not gonna yak all over all these things. No. You don't feel weird drink anymore. Dude, you fucking sick. Dude, you gotta drink half a bottle of rum. That's a lot of rum. That's a lot of fucking rum, dude. Kirsten, what were you doing to me? <laughs> As you were puking, did you ever utter the phrase, I'm never drinking again? Eventually, we got the chain plate made up by an incredibly cool Bahamian machinist, and we were ready to go. We took some short sails around the island while we waited for the right weather, and to make sure that nothing else would break. Then, late one afternoon, we filled up our water one last time and set off on a 130-mile sail to Nassau. We finally felt like this was it, the moment where, after a year of work, we would at last be sailing off into the Caribbean. A couple of days before, Lisa had found a bottle of champagne sitting on top of a trash can, so we decided to smash it across the bow for luck once we were underway. But I would like to offer this bottle of champagne to any potential rulers of the sea. May they treat us well. And the wind, and the sky. Yeah. Fair weather. Please. And following seas. And following seas. <laughs> Keep it going. And could we please, not if soon. you're not there, could you show us the green flash? <laughs> I always want to see the green flash. That's all. Break it up. Wait, right, hold up a second. <laughs> I need to zoom out. <laughs> the sun set and we each did our watches through the night. It was calm sailing and downwind the whole time. The next day, we awoke to a world of water. You feel small out there, all alone without any land in sight. And in the Bahamas, there are many places where you could be miles away from shore, but still in danger of running aground. Here we're about to pass through the Northwest Channel, and Ali is keeping a close eye on the bottom deck. The wind picked up and shifted forward of us, and at the end of the second night, we sailed around 90 miles. This is our taffrail log, which tows a little propeller that pushes this little dial around to tell us how far we've traveled. Around 3 a.m. on the second night, we started sailing towards the Nassau Harbor entrance. It's always difficult to find your way into a strange harbor at night without smashing up on the rocks, but the Nassau entrance is fairly wide, and we made it in alright. What we didn't know was that we were sailing into a whirling maelstrom of nightmares generated by tourism. Once you get close to any harbor entrance, you really have to start paying attention to which way the tide is running, what the wind is doing, and whether you're making leeway through the water or not. In close quarters and shallow waters, a situation can very quickly deteriorate to the point where you've lost control and are steadily heading towards a looming cliff face. Our entire stay in Nassau was easily described by our first 10 minutes sailing through the harbor. We found ourselves trying to sail upwind with the current set against us through a narrow passage made narrower by the presence of a giant cruise ship. We'd tack back and forth through the channel, but the sheer size of the cruise ship was enough to block the wind we needed to get through. Time and time again we'd tack back across the channel, only to find ourselves directly below the same porthole, which was apparently the window to the ballroom, where some kind of disco dance party was in full swing. It was annoying that the cruise ship was preventing us from getting through, but it was just insulting that they had to have a disco dance party as they were doing it. 
Nassau is the worst of the Bahamas. The town has become a collection of shops selling trinkets, a Starbucks every few blocks, and a giant hotel slash casino modeled and named after the lost city of Atlantis. The rhythm of life is intimately tied to the schedule of arriving cruise ships, for which everyone waits hungrily. One interesting thing about Nassau was the traffic crossing signals. In the United States, the walk signal is an image of a person with stiff legs, looking a little beaten, maybe slightly timid. I always imagine him as a professional on his way home from work, thinking about the troubles of his day, possibly with a briefcase in his hand. But in the Bahamas, the walk signal is just some dude, clearly strolling along, taking big steps with a bounce in his walk. After a few days and a few repairs, we made our escape. Go through. Ready, Bob! Complete! Sail changers. Ready, Mark? Get set. Go. Go. Seconds. Woo! Woo! Oh, uh, <laughs> Three minutes, forty five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> now, I get a lot of questions about toilets on boats. How do you go? People will often ask me. The pestilence, like the tall ships of old, does not have a built-in toilet. Bathrooms are often referred to as the head because sailors used to go to the head of the boat, where they would climb out on a rope hanging there to do their business. On the pestilence, we employ a diversity of tactics, but there are two main camps. I personally enjoy the bucket technique, while Lisa is most fond of the direct deposit. Time for what we call a DD.
<laughs> That's what we call direct deposit. Sailing is exhausting. The thing about it is, when you're out there, you can't ever stop to take a break. You're always sailing, and there's always work to be done. We'd take turns doing two-hour watches at night, but even then, sleep is almost constantly interrupted, even when you're off watch. Lisa will be on watch, and I'll have just dozed off to sleep when she'll shout down, It's all Weatherhelm up here! Tumble up and let's take down this Genoa! So you'll drag yourself out of your berth, put on your harness or foul weather gear, and get back on deck. Imagine doing the sail change you just saw, but at night, and often because the conditions have worsened to the point where the wind is blowing so hard that it's threatening to break every stitch in the sail. The surrounding darkness is expansive, and I always pause a moment before going forward at night to tell myself, if you fall over, you're dead. My particular feat was to have the berth directly next to the cabin entrance, such that I was the closest person to whoever was on watch. Lisa's greatest fear is collision at sea, so whenever she saw the lights of another vessel at night, no matter how far away, she'd wake me up to ask my opinion on whether we were going to collide or not. If it's not too hot to sleep during the day, you'll generally try to sleep whenever you can, for as long as you can. We are an oddity among sailors in more ways than one. The fact that we're not baby boomers sailing into retirement automatically distinguishes us from the other sailors we might encounter, not to mention that our boat is smaller than everyone else's and that we live in comparative squalor. But what really seems to make us a curiosity is that we sail everywhere. Those of us that sail without engines are generally considered lunatics, but I've noticed that this judgment is often spoken with a tinge of envy. This is most clear when anchoring. As a rule, nobody comes into a narrow space under sail, nobody maneuvers close to other boats under sail, and nobody drops their anchor under sail. You'll see boats approaching a harbor, and half a mile out, the sails will come down. The iron sail, their engine, will come on. To us, though, this is where the art of sailing is to be found. Anyone can stare at a compass for hours on end in the open ocean, but knowing how to maneuver a boat in tight spaces is where you gain an intimate and nuanced understanding of sail balance, sail trim, and all the various forces at work on a sailboat. So when we come into an anchorage with our sails up, moving nimbly between the shores and the other boats at rest there, we're really making an entrance. We sailed into this anchorage on the front end of a gale and zipped downwind at full speed. As we passed the first boat, I saw an older couple abruptly jump to their feet in their cockpit, shocked at the sight of us screaming past under reefed sails. One of them tried to shout something to us over the wind, apparently because she thought we were having some kind of malfunction and couldn't get our sails down. They looked on eagerly as we rounded up sharply into the wind, backwinded our jib, came to a complete stop on the water, dropped an anchor off the bow, and fell back onto it smartly. When the anchor set, I looked up from the bow of the pestilence to see this 67-year-old guy looking at us with wide eyes, stoically standing on the stern of his boat with one fist in the air. I waved back sheepishly. Here, Lisa and Kirsten are rowing out a second anchor. Other people think that this is so strange that it's almost become embarrassing. Most people purchase incredible lengths of heavy chain, with which they attach their boats to their anchors. 200 feet of 3 quarter inch chain does a lot to hold your boat in place. We only have a few short lengths of chain, though, and so we have to make up the difference by tying many different pieces of line together in order to produce an anchor cable that's 150 to 200 feet in length, with about 15 feet of chain at the very end. So unlike most others in an anchorage, we can't just throw one giant anchor with a bunch of chain overboard and forget about it. We have to deploy two, three, or sometimes even four different anchors in different locations, at different ankles, and at different lengths. So we row the anchors out in our dinghy, drop them overboard, and then row the lines back to the boat. From there, we can tighten them and adjust the tension as necessary. There are other times when, not having a lot of chain, we still need to get more weight on the anchor lines so that they're held down towards the bottom where you get better holding power. For these situations, we'll use a bag of bricks. Bombs away. Sailing 
Sometimes late at night, when the wind is threatening a gale, it's necessary to row out another anchor, or adjust the anchors that are already out. The wind will blow cold, it's pitch black, and you'd give anything to lay down inside instead of wrestling with anchor lines or stepping into a partially submerged dinghy. But you also know that you'll never be able to sleep with the knowledge that, as soon as you close your eyes, the boat you're in could drag right up onto the rocks. Here, Kirsten carefully listens to the wind gods before rowing out another anchor in the direction that the wind is going to shift. <laughs> Whenever someone disappears into the darkness by rowing our marginal dinghy out into foul weather, we always hope we'll see them again. Because when the wind is blowing this hard, it's impossible to hear the shouts of anyone who's downwind of you. They're on their own. Once, to avoid the hassle of blowing up the dinghy, I even swam out an anchor. Yeah, some people think rowing out an anchor is salty. <laughs> Try swimming out an anchor. <laughs> Gotta get up pretty early. Nobody swims out an anchor. <laughs> Gotta get up pretty early in the morning. Nobody I'll does this, but uh. I'll salt this. But you, really? <laughs> you don't. Alright, you gotta answer me. I. Shark three. Okay. Always a tangle. Untangle. Wait, more tangling is happening. After we'd been out for a few weeks, our hunting and gathering started in earnest. On a boat the size of the Pestilence, with four people, it's really impossible to carry enough food, and places to resupply are literally far between. There are other questions as well. For instance, living on a boat makes you aware of things that you might not be as aware of otherwise. You are under no illusions that your water comes from the tap, because you know very well just how precariously you collected rainfall, or just how long it took to row jugs from the cistern to your boat. Likewise, there is no trash pickup. If you generate trash on a boat, it stays on your boat until you can figure something out. This makes storing food that is packaged in plastic a bad idea, and even canned goods can be difficult to deal with near shore. So finding and catching food is really the way to go. In my opinion, the most effective way to catch food is to get in the water. I made a Hawaiian sling like the one Earl taught me to use, and got pretty into diving with it. With practice, I could make it around 50 feet down, although I couldn't stay down very long at that depth, and rarely needed to go that far anyways. This is me ascending in 54 foot water. Say what you want about the efficacy of Earth First, but there are definitely some coconuts that we would not have been able to reach without Earth First motivated training. I just pulled on it. By the way, if any North American squatters are beginning to think that the scene is too difficult there, I'd highly recommend checking out Norman's Key in the Exumas chain of the Bahamas. In the early 1980s, Carlos Laterman took it over as a distribution point for moving cocaine into the United States. He built houses, a pier, and cisterns that are still usable today. When he was eventually captured and imprisoned, all of the infrastructure that he built was left vacant. In the middle of the bay formed by Norman's Key is the wreckage of a DC-9 aircraft, which ditched out after a failed landing or takeoff attempt during the drug running days. There are a lot of fish around it, but they hang out under the fuselage and are difficult to spear. So we tried a tactic of snorkel-assisted fishing. We dropped Lisa off on top of the plane, where she would lower a baited hook into the water. Kirsten stayed in the water with a snorkel and mask to give Lisa directions on where to move the line and how deep it should go. This worked quite well, and here you can see that they've just caught a squirrel fish. In addition to fish and lobster, there are conch. The 
Conch basically have very little going for them in their attempts to survive human predation. They don't move fast, and they don't hide. It's just a matter of swimming down to the bottom and picking them up. Their shell is quite hard, but if you have a hammer, the conch is pretty much out of luck. It took us 20 minutes to get the first conch we caught out of its shell. Eventually, we could do it in 3 or 4. Lisa is a master at cleaning conch, and contends that there is no better way to skin the muscle than with your teeth. We would also catch fish by trolling a line while sailing. I'm gonna pull it up and you can look at it. Okay. <laughs> Dude, it's so pretty. I don't think it'll This is a dolphin fish, also known as mahi mahi. Killing a fish can be pretty gruesome, and it's easier with some species than others. The most straightforward way is to knock them out with a winch handle, but there's a tendency for people to hit the fish softly, where really the best thing you can do is knock it out swiftly by hitting it as hard as you can. We found the easiest way to actually kill a fish is to cut its head off straight away. When a dolphin fish dies, its brilliantly beautiful colors all fade away. It started to rain just then, so we hung the fish up while we waited to clean it. This fish ended up feeding all of us for three days. Navigation is a big part of sailing. The problem is that, at sea, there's very little to help you determine your location. In addition to the absence of things like road signs, there are also no roads or landmarks of any kind. Only water in every direction. A large part of navigation is becoming comfortable with the knowledge that you don't really know where you are. Good navigators are amazing people, able to derive much from the few clues they're given. For hundreds of years, people sailed with only the knowledge of bottom depth and prevailing wind direction. If the winds usually blew from the north, then the direction the wind was blowing from was probably north. Directions would read, proceed north until bottom depth of 55 fathoms with white sand. 
Can you imagine sailing out onto the open ocean with only prevailing wind directions and a long, weighted line to help you find your way? More recently, people would take sights off celestial objects to determine their more precise location. Even this isn't extremely accurate, and a well-placed cloud can easily ruin your once-a-day observation. Tanya Abbey, the youngest person to sail around the world alone, departed from New York with only a sextant and absolutely no knowledge on how to use it. She made it to her first destination, Bermuda, using only luck and intuition. It wasn't until she'd made it through the Panama Canal and down to the Galapagos Islands that she learned how to use her sextant. With the advent of GPS, much of the amazing navigation talent that used to grow in sailors is being lost. There are also an increasing number of GPS accidents. What people are beginning to realize is that the nautical charts really aren't very accurate. People used to give obstructions a mile wide berth since they didn't very precisely know where they were. Now using GPS, people attempt to sail 50 feet around an obstruction, only to hit it and realize that the chart is incorrect by 50 feet. We try to hone our navigation skills by sailing without GPS as much as we're comfortable. Here Lisa is plotting our position by using a navigation technique known as dead reckoning. Unfortunately, Lisa is a notoriously bad navigator, and hours later we discovered that she'd plotted that position incorrectly by five miles. When we went back and ran our actual right course along the chart, we'd right sailed there. through all kinds of danger signals, rocks, coral heads marked by X's, Dead and reckon. pictures of shipwrecks. But those experiences make me more confident, and convince me that it's actually pretty difficult to hit things. Although, we did run aground once. When attempting to row out a kedge anchor, some people came over in a powerboat and offered to tow us off the sandbar. They had seen us sail into Pipe Creek the day before and had glowingly commented on how impressed they were by the fact that we anchored under sail. So it was a little embarrassing when, the very next day, they pulled us off a sandbar. It turns out that they're the people that make the charts we use, and the guy at the helm tried to make me feel better by saying, don't worry son, if you haven't run aground, you haven't been anywhere. I smiled sheepishly, and he continued, You know, there are three different types of sailors. Those who have run aground, those who will run aground, and liars. We spent the better part of the day untangling ourselves from this mistake. What's the situation? Well, it's a constant battle. Too much wind or not enough wind. When you're out in 30 knots, you think, God, I wish it was just fucking calm and we could sail easily. And then here we are, like five knots of wind, current set against us, tacking back and forth through this channel, making pretty much no progress. Allie and Lisa went to uh, rub out an anchor and got set off into the, into the sunset. And uh, so we're gonna have to meet up a little later. Freshening a little bit. You know, we'll make some headway. It's not looking good. It's not looking good. How about our food situation? We're out of food. <laughs> Honestly. And the means to cook it? Yeah, we're out of stove fuel. <laughs> Caught a fish today. How about water, Mike? Oh yeah, we're out of water too. <laughs> foul weather. This is simultaneously the best and worst of sailing. Going through foul weather is a terrifying, destructive, and exhausting experience, but the real sailing maniacs also see beauty in the raw power of the ocean during these moments. Here we were trying to make it around the northern point of Long Island before the weather worsened, but we didn't make it in time. This is long before we saw the worst of it, just as things are starting to get bad. Kirsten and Allie are changing the jib down to a smaller sail. High winds can be difficult, but the real trouble comes from the large swell that they kick up. The sun set, and the swell grew larger and larger, first 5 feet, then 8 feet. At the worst of it, we were probably seeing 11 foot sets. Still sailing slightly upwind, the boat would climb up the face of a wave and then careen down the backside, slamming into the water behind it with a bone chilling thud that made the whole boat shudder. Running downwind, we encountered a number of rogue waves. I'll never forget one wave that broke so hard into the cockpit, it threw me across the cabin and knocked my head against the wall. 
I looked up to see that there was so much water in the cockpit, Allie and Lisa were literally swimming. out there, there's nothing you can do. Sitting with one hand on the tiller, you ask yourself what the hell you're doing there, why you decided to go out, why you're sailing at all. You're overwhelmed by the sheer impassivity of the ocean. You can't beg with it, you can't plead with it. There are no arrangements that you can make with it at all. It doesn't care. It just pounds you over and over again, relentlessly, and there's not a thing you can do. You'd give anything to be anywhere else. You think about comfortable beds, snack foods, riding a bicycle. You can scream, you can beg for mercy, you can stamp your feet, or even appeal to the sensibilities of the great Neptune himself. But in the end, there's nothing to do but hold fast. I always try to remind myself that boats are almost always stronger than the people in them, and that if I can just hold fast, eventually I might make it through. But boy does our boat leak. Everything gets wet, and the bilge fills with water over and over again. John's parting words to us were, keep the rig up and keep the water out. The rest is just inconvenience. So that's what we do, pumping out water all night long. You've also got to force yourself to eat. Shit's flying everywhere, the boat is getting jostled around like a cork, water is pouring down the hatch, and you're sitting there trying to boil a pot of water on an alcohol stove. Eventually we ran down the length of Long Island and sailed 150 miles at 7.5 knots until we were in the lee of Crooked Island. There we dropped the anchor a few miles offshore, dried out, and slept for a day straight. We put the sails back up and started sailing towards the Turks and Caicos. Some of our clothing was drying out and we were beginning to feel better about this sail when we looked up and saw a tornado on the water about 800 feet away from us. It was a full-on twister, sneaking down from the sky and moving across the water. Kirsten shrieked, Holy shit, what the fuck is that? I'd never seen one before, but the word that immediately came to my mind when I saw it was, water spout. We started taking down the sails as fast as we could, and then Allie screamed, Oh my god, another one! Directly behind us was another water spout. We all dove in the cabin, sealed the door, and braced ourselves. Hold on, hold on, let me, let me get this. Hey, watch out, watch out, let me get the... <laughs> Looks like it's dissipating. Can I watch too? Or else it's getting close to <laughs> This one's like on us. I want some water. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. The sailor's weather bed. Heavy weather. Tactics. I don't know. I'm going to put on my harness though. Water spouts are a very strange phenomena and are popularly explained by some very curious myths. Actually, there are two types. One, as just mentioned, is a tornado that has moved from the land where it formed out over the water. 
This type of tornado is pure and simple with all the nasty characteristics that go with it. Consequently, it's extremely dangerous to anyone in a small boat or a big ship for that matter. <laughs> the more ocean oh, making me feel better already. We're nowhere near <laughs> that kind of land. Come on. Yeah. The more common oceanic water spout is considerably different. It is far less violent convectional phenomenon that can occur almost anywhere at any time in temperate or tropical waters and in fair weather or foul. It too forms a heavy cumulus type cloud and is caused by a localized convection current. First, the narrow dark cone starts to taper down from the base of the cloud. Directly below this, the surface water becomes agitated. Oh yeah. Now, a second cone forms, funneling upward from the surface. The two finally meet to become a single, continuous, long, whirling tube. The spout moves slowly along with its parent cloud for a while until it thins out and separates again into two parts. The upper part moves back into the cloud, the lower falls back into the sea. The violence associated with this type of water spout varies considerably. It may be no stronger than a common desert dust devil, or it may be strong enough to destroy small craft. However, in We weathered the water spouts and eventually limped into the island of Providencialis in the Turks and Caicos. Here, we were greeted by a boat of five Mormon children who baked us cookies. They lived on a neighboring sailboat with their parents, who had come to the Turks and Caicos to promote the good word of Joseph Smith. These kids were the most polite children I've ever met in my life. They would always call me Sir, and when I mentioned that it wasn't necessary, they looked very uncomfortable. I could almost see the wheels spinning in their heads, frantically trying to calculate the various levels of rudeness. Is it more rude to address someone without calling them Sir, or to call them Sir after they've asked you not to? Finally, we set off on our last passage to the Dominican Republic. You're looking lethargic, and I'm taping the serene sunset here on Pestilence. Do you want your cocktail, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Where is my cocktail? <laughs> and what about my cocktail? You have to put your pants on first. <laughs> Isn't that kind of place? <laughs> We'll get the green flash on the film. How about? I'm sure we'll get it. Dude. Oh! Fucker! Every night! You're so sad. You want to see the flash? We made it to the Dominican Republic without much trouble, and there I decided that I'd probably take my leave from the pestilence. I was kind of tired of sailing, and I really wanted to visit Haiti. So we said our goodbyes, and Kirsten dropped me off on shore. I crossed over the river into Haiti, where I set off in search of the Haitian sailors. I walked through beautiful tropical countrysides that were absolutely covered in trash, stared down UN tanks, and rode in the flatbed of a pickup truck with 20 other people. Eventually, I found a sizable port in Cap Haitian, which was full of sailors. Haitian sailors are probably the best sailors left in the world. Almost every single working boat in Haiti operates under sail alone. This means all fishing boats, personal transport boats, and boats for moving commercial goods into and out of the country are sailboats without engines. I met a group of kids my age who had a 40-foot wooden boat they'd built themselves, which they used to smuggle people and goods. The mast was obviously an unplaned tree, the boom was a less than straight branch, the rigging was random pieces of webbing, and the sails were stitched together pieces of canvas. But this took them far. They had no electronic navigation of any kind, no mounted compass, and yet regularly sailed as far as Miami using only the stars and intuition. I was in awe of their sailing abilities, and I think they were a little surprised at how much respect I had for their endeavors. They showed me around the harbor for a few days, told me about how things worked, and just generally hung out. I traveled around Haiti for a while and thought about trying to make some passages with the Haitian sailors that I had met, but I almost felt too worn out to face the ocean again so soon, and my homesickness was getting worse and worse. So I snuck back across the river into the Dominican Republic, 
where I left Hispaniola for the cold nights of San Francisco once more. Thanks for watching my video zine.